Uh, today, if you have your Bibles, you can join me in Acts chapter 27. Um, and, and as you're turning there, uh, let me give you just a little bit of background about what we're about to read. Uh, in Acts chapter 27, we're going to pick up on verse 27 and read uh, moving forward. However, if you want to know more of the story, just rewind a little bit further in Acts. And what you'll find is that the Apostle Paul, uh, who has been traveling throughout uh, you know, uh, the, the Gentile world, if you will, uh, preaching the message of, of salvation, preaching the message of Christ um, and, and, and the gospel message of, of forgiveness and all of this, um, he has bridged the gap uh, that was previously there between the Jewish people and the Gentile people. Now, even with that said, I, I do want to just make sure I clarify this, that the Apostle Peter uh, was the first uh, of the disciples to preach and uh, convert uh, Gentiles to Christianity. However, Paul is kind of known as the Gentile preacher because he reaches into the Gentile world like nobody else did before him. Uh, and he, he started churches uh, in, in many of the different towns that he went to, uh, and he um, preached the gospel message to anyone and everyone. Uh, he, he did not put qualifications on there of who could hear uh, the gospel message and respond to it. Uh, whether that was Jew or Gentile, whether that was male or female, whether that was slave or free people, whether that was uh, the socioeconomical rich or the poor, it did not matter. The Apostle Paul wanted the message of Christ to be available for everyone, which made him an incredibly popular person uh, with many, and it made him an incredibly unpopular person with many others. Um, and so, um, what we find as we come to Acts chapter 27 is that the Apostle Paul has returned to Jerusalem. Uh, he has gathered a bunch, of, um, a bunch of money from some of the churches that have raised money to support the ministry uh, of the church in Jerusalem. And he comes back to Jerusalem to participate uh, in, a, in a, uh, a council with other, uh, the other apostles, um, but also to bring that, that that offering gift to the church in Jerusalem and all of those sorts of things. And when he first gets to Jerusalem, everything is going the way that it should. They're happy to see him. They're happy to hear the good news of the gospel spreading uh, throughout the, the, the Roman world. And, and they're happy to hear all of this news. Uh, ish. Some people are happy. Some are not. Um, some people start to argue with him about, uh, about Gentiles being uh, redeemed by God and whether or not this was legit and to what level this needed to look. You know, did they have to become Jew first in order to be uh, redeemed by God? And uh, it comes to this, this moment where the Apostle Paul is, is accused um, by the Jewish people uh, of being uh, kind of sacrilegious in a way because he allows Gentiles to go to the temple and worship. And, and so this large crowd gathers, and, and, and there is a mob ready to harm him. Uh, and so the, the Roman government uh, responds in, in quick fashion. Uh, if you study biblical archaeology at all, what you know is that the Roman government uh, built a barracks literally right on the corner of the temple grounds because there was a location where many riots had started in the past. And so there were troops on hand right there. And they come and they, of course, arrest Paul. And, and they, they um, end up uh, trying to figure out what's going on and, and why this guy is inciting a riot. And Paul is like, I'm not inciting a riot. They're trying to kill me and all of this stuff. And so the Romans try to move the Apostle Paul to a different location where he'll be safe. And some of the Jewish people conspire a plot to try to um, kill him in, in, in rout and overtake the, the Roman guards. Uh, and, and all of this transpires. And the Roman officials finally figure out, you know what? The people really don't like Paul. And there's something going on here. And so let's get rid of Paul. Let's just execute him because then the people will calm down. Um, even though they had no grounds of, of him actually being guilty of anything. And so that's their plan. But Paul is a Roman citizen, and so that throws them a, a little bit of a wrench in their works, and they have to actually go by the law and have proof that he did something wrong, and so they place him under arrest, and they are going to transport him all the way to Rome where he will stand trial. We pick up in Acts chapter 27 in that journey. They are on their way to Rome where Paul will face uh, his, his trial. 
Um, we know the story uh, as we've read scripture that a lot happens. It's not like uh, they send him to Rome and the next day his trial takes place. There is something massive that happens on the journey to Rome. Uh, and then even once he arrives in Rome, he is under house arrest for three years before uh, his trial actually takes place. And in the end, he is uh, executed uh, for his faith and for uh, being one who... who um, preaches the gospel and disturbs the peace by doing so. We pick up in Acts chapter 27 in verse 27 where the Apostle Paul and his traveling companions are in a tough spot. They have been traveling by ship, uh, making their way towards Rome through the Mediterranean Sea. They have encountered a massive storm. Um, and as we pick up in, in verse 27, they have been in the middle of the storm with zero control over their ship for 14 days. They have been stuck in that situation, unable to get out of the storm, unable to control their ship. 14 solid days. The men haven't even eaten in all of those 14 days because uh, of the, the tumultuous sea and everything that is going on there uh, and, and taking place. And so we pick up in verse 27. About midnight on the 14th night of the storm, as we were being driven across the sea of Adria, the sailors sensed land was near, and they dropped a weighted line and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A little later, they measured again and found that it was only 90 feet deep. And at this rate, they were afraid that they would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore. So they threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Then the sailors tried to abandon the ship, and they lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. And just as day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You have been worried that you haven't, um, you have been so you have been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair of your heads will perish. And then he took some bread and he gave thanks to God before them all. And he broke off a piece and he ate it. And then everyone was encouraged and they began to eat. All 276 of us who were on board the ship. And after eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. And then morning dawned, and they didn't recognize the coastline. But they saw a bay with a beach and wondered if they could get to shore by running the ship aground. So they cut off the anchors, and they left them to the sea, and they lowered the rudders and raised the foresail and headed towards the shore. But they hit a shoal and ran the ship aground too soon, and the bow of the sh ship struck first. And it stuck fast. And while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves, and it began to break apart. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure that they didn't swim ashore and escape. But the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul. And so he didn't let them carry out their plan. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump aboard first, overboard first, and make for land. And the others held on to the planks and the debris from the broken ship so that everyone escapes safely to the shore. Beginning the next chapter, verse 1. Once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. And the people of the island were very kind to us. And it was cold and rainy, and so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. As Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake, driven out by the heat, bit him on the hand. And the people of the island saw it hanging from his hand and said to each other, A murderer, no doubt. And though he escaped from the sea, justice will not permit him to live. But Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. The people waited for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. But when they had waited a long time, they saw that he wasn't harmed, and they changed their minds and decided that he was a god. Jesus, this story, this situation that is taking place as we read it, um, it's pretty amazing to hear just, God, how you move in unique circumstances. 
God, I pray that you would open your words to us, that we would hear your message for us today. That this wouldn't just be a good story uh, about how people made it safe to shore, but God, that this would be a story of, of how you move in our lives as well. So open our minds to it, that we would hear your truth. Open our hearts to it, that we would listen to your still small voice. God, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would have freedom in this place amongst every man, woman, and child here. God, that you would have freedom in the place of where we are. So we thank you and we praise you for what you're doing. God, I pray that your words would be heard and not my own. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So this story is pretty amazing. Uh, I love how Luke writes it in the book of Acts here. I was reading from the New Living Translation. It reads slightly different in different translations. But Luke, he's writing this story and he gives so much description of what's taking place. You can almost feel the intensity of the situation as the sailors are trying to figure out what to do. And they have no clue what to do to save the ship. They have been fighting against this storm for days and days and days. They have been so worried. They haven't eaten. They're, they're, they're running on, on fumes of energy, and they're just, they have nothing left to give. Luke writes the details about how uh, the sailors decide to abandon the ship and leave everyone else on board and how that plan plays out. He gives the details about the Roman soldiers uh, wanting to kill the prisoners and then the commanding officer for the sake of Paul saves all of them, which I think all of the other prisoners became Paul's best friend at that moment. Um, and, and we see all of these things happening and, and, and Luke gives us such detail as he records them. And as if the storm and the shipwreck and the not eating for 14 days and oh, by the way, being arrested isn't enough? When they finally make it to shore, what happens to Paul right off is this story that is my literal worst nightmare. It, it combines my two biggest fears of almost drowning and snakes. Those two together, just not okay. Just not all right. And the Apostle Paul, he gets to shore and he might be thankful for a moment that they survived and everything is great and everything is good. And then this snake bites him. And I don't know if you paid attention to the small details here as Luke talks about the snake situation. Paul is gathering these sticks and, and he's gathering these, uh, this, this wood for the fire. And a snake in the midst of all of the wood that he has gathered latches onto his hand. Doesn't just bite him and move on. It latches on to his hand. Can I make this picture any worse than it is? I mean, understand that the, the people are waiting to see what will happen. And, and they're, they're, they're seeing the snake hanging on to him. Uh, and, and they see, verse 4, it's very clear. The people of the island see it hanging from his hand. And they just assume that amongst all of these prisoners, this guy must really be a bad guy. And fate is going to have its way with him. And we see this story playing out. Paul, he shakes it off, throws it into the fire, moves on as if nothing else had ever happened. Paul's my hero. Paul is my hero. And as they wait for justice to set in, for the poison to do its job, for Paul to succumb to this situation, they realize this isn't human. Uh, this isn't human intervention. This must be the power of God working. And so they open this door, this window uh, of belief. Now, in this situation, it tells us they start to believe that he is a God. If we continue reading in the book of Acts and, and follow through, what we find is that there's this place close by uh, where uh, an official lives, Paul goes there, all of the people go there, this official provides for them, and all of this stuff takes place. And while he's there, he begins to use the power of God to heal people. He meets people where they're at, in the middle of their need, and he heals them in the name of Christ. 
and, and these people, they respond in a powerful way. The Apostle Paul, he has this opportunity to share the grace of God in the middle of this weird situation. Can you imagine what Paul must have been thinking when this all went down? I mean, can you really wrap your mind around it? Uh, if I were to quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 25, maybe this is somewhat of what Paul is thinking, and then I'll add a little piece to the end of it. And it's just speculation. But as I read those verses, we read, Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And three times I've been shipwrecked. This one amongst them. That's what first, or 2 Corinthians 11 says. But I have to imagine Paul is thinking all of these things, and now this? Really, God? Really? Now? This? A snake? Understand, life doesn't always go the way that you intended to. Things don't always happen the way that we would want them to. Matter of fact, I don't think there's a single person in this room that can say that, you know what, everything has always gone the way that I wanted it to, right? We're thrown curveballs from time to time in life. We are thrown maybe not as severe as snakes and shipwrecks, but sometimes it might seem that severe. Um, and, and we are thrown these massive things that derail the plan. How do we respond? What do we do in those situations? What would God have us to do in those situations? Those are some important questions for us to ask. How do we respond in and of ourselves? Many times, what we see in humanity is we don't respond well. If it's a small thing or a big thing, a lot of times we don't respond well when it doesn't go the way we intended it to or the way that we want it to. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, how do you respond to them? With pleasantness? Or with a little of aggression of your own? When the prices go up at the store and you just don't understand why, how do you respond? When the weather is not what you anticipated it to be, when things don't go the way that they should at work, when uh, your family is in turmoil and, and things don't add up and you don't know how to fix it, how do you respond in those situations? If you are left to your own devices and if you are left um, to your humanness, oftentimes it's not great. We don't respond at our best when we are facing adversity many times. How should we respond? I think that's the easy one to answer of these three questions. We should respond with grace. We should respond with love and kindness and a selflessness in the midst of the situation. We should respond with an understanding that it far exceeds our own knowledge and our own capacity. We can acknowledge all of these things of how we should act, but we don't do it that way many times. How would God want us to respond? What would God have for us to do when we are faced with situations that are contrary to what we would want them to be. You see, here's the thing. There are a lot of great sermons out there about the love of God, and it is very real. The love of God, it is amazing. I would be nowhere without it. But I think sometimes we forget to talk about those times when we have a choice to respond in a way that God would want us to or to respond out of our humanness. And this situation is one of those, I think, for the Apostle Paul. Paul could have responded one way. He could have been angry at being falsely arrested. He could have been upset at the Roman soldiers or his, uh, the sailors on board, or he could have been upset at God. Like, why are you making me go through all of this? He could have had all of these different things. But what we see in the middle of this whole story is a different Paul than all of that. In the middle of a storm that is crazy hard, Paul is the one voice of peace in the middle of that storm. Paul is the one who is giving instruction to the Roman who has him arrested. 
on how to be safe and move forward. Paul is the one who is encouraging others to eat and to strengthen themselves. Paul makes this bold promise in the middle of it. It doesn't matter about this storm because none of you are going to perish. He has no grounds for that. Paul's not a sailor. Paul has no way of saving them, but Paul has a relationship with God. And so his response is this calm presence in the middle of chaos. Paul's response with the snake is almost laughable at how little attention he pays to the situation. I want to shake him a little bit and say, Paul, a poisonous snake just bit you and is still hanging onto your hand. Do something. And he just casually shakes it off into the fire like it's no big deal. Dude's jacked up, by the way. That's messed up. And in all of this, Paul, he just goes about being the guy that God has created him to be. Being the guy that doesn't fear the things of the world, even when they're out of his control. Being the guy who is more focused on the others around him, really getting that message of Jesus at the Last Supper of washing others' feet instead of concerning yourself with your own prestige. Paul, he's all about serving everyone else around him. He's all about gathering up the wood for the fire. That's not his job. He's all about all of these things. And so, I want us to understand a couple of truths that this story presents for us, for our lives. First, it doesn't have to go your way to be the right way. A lot of times we assume that our way is the right way, right? I mean, that's what we all prefer, is our way to be the way that it works out. We assume that our way is the right way because we have our way based on our own knowledge. We have our own way based on our own experiences. We have our own way uh, based on the circumstances around us and how we can uh, put it together and all of this sort of thing. But that doesn't mean that it is the right way. Uh, Matt the other day was teasing me because I use this verse all the time. But there is this verse in the Old Testament that his ways are greater than our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. And so it's really weird that we oftentimes assume that our way is the right way when God many, many times has a completely different thought process on the situation and a completely different way of moving in that situation than we would have put together. Matter of fact, Genesis through Revelation, it's a rare story where things work out the way that the person expected them to or designed them to. Most of the time, Genesis through Revelation, God moves in ways the people didn't see or could predict or understand even, and God still moves. And in this story, we come to this truth that it doesn't have to be your way in order to be the right way. That's a hard truth to actually take hold of. I think we can all agree with the head knowledge. Yep, I get it. God, you can do your thing. And we'll just fall in line with what you want to do. You know that awesome prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And that sounds great. But when we are in the middle of it, do we often say, not my will, but yours be done? That's the hard part. It's actually not just head knowledge, acknowledging the fact that God's ways and his thoughts are above our own and that his way is the better way, but just to get ourselves out of the way in the middle of everything else and say, okay, God, I'm all in for whatever you're doing. I'm all on board for this. It doesn't have to be your way to be the right way. How do you respond When God asks you to do something you weren't prepared to do, how do you respond when you find yourself in a situation where it totally didn't go how you wanted it to? How do you respond? It doesn't have to be your way. There is real wisdom. There is real grace in coming to this spot where we say, okay, I recognize, God, that you're doing something different here. 
and I don't fully understand exactly how it's going to play out. I don't fully understand exactly what you're doing, why you're shipwrecking this situation and, and, and making us go a different direction, but I'm all in. Here we go, God. It doesn't have to be my way. It takes real wisdom. It takes real grace to admit that and to move forward without a bitterness and to just trust that God is putting the pieces together. We don't have to understand his way. We don't have to understand or even see the results of it ever play out. Because the results might not be visible to us. It might be something that is far down the road that God moves in his purpose. So just come to that peace. Come to that moment of realization that, you know what? There is a lot of things in this world that aren't going to go the way I want it to. And that's okay. Because it doesn't have to be my way. Let me just trust you, God, in the middle of this storm. Let me just trust you in the middle of this shipwreck. Let me just trust you in the middle of this poisonous situation. Let me just trust you. But also in this story, I see kind of this attitude and this persona of Paul as he's filled with the Holy Spirit, of, of another truth that we need is that when we come to this realization, you know what, it doesn't have to be my way, the next truth is that we need to understand that we can just shake it off. Not the, the, the song that's popular in, in, in our pop culture today, but we just need to understand that there is a lot of things in this world that are going to affect us, and we get to choose how we respond to those things. And the best choice is to shake off those things that could so easily derail us. How different would this story have read if I had been there instead of Paul? He was gathering up the sticks for the fire. He threw them in and a snake bit him. And then he ran through the crowd screaming like a girl and wondering if he was going to die. That's how it would have read. In this situation, Paul just shakes it off. He just casually shakes it off. Now, I'm not saying that we can't take things seriously in life. Um, there are times when God wants us to take things seriously. And it's not that we shouldn't have concern about things working out in the world around us, not the way that we would want them to or anything of that nature. We have the right to, to feel concern and, and, and to look at the circumstances of the world around us and and all of that, but we need to have this trust in God that is so steadfast that it doesn't matter what those circumstances are, we can shake them off as still part of his plan and be okay with it. On the ship, Paul reassures the sailors, the soldiers, his fellow prisoners, it's all good, guys. None of us are going to die. He shakes it off. He's gathering the wood. He gets bit by a snake. He just casually shakes it off and goes about the rest of the business. It's almost comical that there's no more conversation from Paul about that situation. He just moves on. He just moves on. And in our world, when we are thrown curveballs, do we shake it off? I'm not a baseball player. Uh, I, I didn't have enough coordination for all that. I was a runner. But I do know the truth that when you get to the plate and you swing at a bad pitch, if you hang on to that, you are more likely to swing at more bad pitches. And one of the things that softball and baseball coaches always say is that you have to shake it off. Shake off that, that bad swing. Shake off that bad decision. Shake off that bad moment and just start that next pitch as though it's fresh and new as though that first one never happened. In the same way in our world, as we walk through this life and as we try to follow God and things maybe don't go the way that we want them to, we need to have this understanding and this complete true faith in God that says, you know what? Okay, so that didn't happen the way I wanted it to. Let's just shake it off. Let's move forward because you know what? Today's a new day where I can follow God. Maybe yesterday I botched it and I had a bad attitude or I responded wrongly, or whatever. Now I'm going to shake it off, and I'm going to start fresh and new in my, in my commitment to follow God no matter what, and I'm going to move forward 
we need to learn to shake it off. And then the last truth I want to point out from this passage of Scripture is this one truth that seems to always be at the core of who Paul is. And that is very simply that we need to show Jesus to those around us in all of our circumstances. Not just the circumstances that we manipulated to look the way we want them to. We need to show Jesus in those too. But we need to show Jesus in the situations that don't go the way that we want them to. We need to show Jesus to the people around us, even in the middle of the storms of this life. We need to show Jesus as we're working through the understanding of what he's doing and trying to come in line uh, with, with our submission to him and our faith journey with him. We still need to show Jesus in those circumstances. Paul, in the middle of this storm, while they're still on the ship and everything's going on, he's encouraging the ones around him. He is serving others. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. I would argue that that's not what Paul did before he knew Christ. The Paul Saul that we know in early Acts before his relationship with Christ is very self-focused, not other-focused. The Saul Paul that we knew before his relationship with Jesus is about legalism instead of love. It's about uh, promotion of self instead of promoting others. And as he surrenders to God and as he builds in relationship with God, God replaces that Saul with a new Paul. In Philippians, we read him kind of list his, his qualifications. You know, it's not just that he was a Roman citizen. He was. It's not just that he had been a Pharisee. He had been. It's not just that he was a Pharisee, but that he was actually one of the leaders of the Pharisees. He was. It's not just that he was all of these things or that he had started churches. He says in the end, I count them all rubbish or trash or they don't matter at all is what Paul's saying in Philippians compared to the knowledge of who God is. That's what really matters. And Paul, he gets it. And in this storm, he shows them Jesus. Did you notice the wording? He, he wants them to get some strength and, and eat. It's been 14 days. Please eat, verse 34, uh, and all of this. And then verse 35, then he took bread. He gave thanks. There in the middle of a storm, who's got time for that? Nope, he gives thanks. He shows them Jesus in that circumstance. And then he breaks the bread. And he eats it. The terminology there, the, the, the wording there in the original language is the same wording for when Jesus in the Last Supper took that bread and broke it. As he had said, this is my body broken for you. That same Greek phrase is there of breaking of bread. It is a Hebrew mark of peace. It is this moment of, uh, of, of trusting God and, and, and having peace in that situation. It sounds like a peaceful moment. They're all gathered on the deck of the ship, and Paul, he takes the bread and he prays over it, and then he breaks it. They are in the middle of a storm. It's not peaceful. But Paul shows them Christ, even in that circumstance. They get to shore. He goes about serving others. He goes about getting the fire ready. He goes about doing all of that. The snake situation happens. If you continue reading, he's not phased by the storm. He's not phased by the shipwreck. He's not phased by the snake. He starts to heal others in the name of Christ. He shows them Christ in their circumstance. Do you show others Jesus in all of your circumstances? Or do we pick and choose which ones we bring Christ into the equation on? On Sundays, that's when we bring Christ into the picture. Well, what about Tuesdays? Uh, you see what I mean? The Apostle Paul, he, he, he realizes that this relationship that he has with God that has transformed him, that has changed him, this relationship is an all-the-time thing. It's an every-moment thing. And so he carries that relationship forward with those around him. He shows 
Jesus wherever he goes. Even while he's arrested, even while he's falsely accused, even while he is shipwrecked, even while he is snake bitten, even while he is uh, about to be executed, all the way to the very end, he shows Jesus. What image are you showing the world around you? At home? What image are you showing the real world around you in your community? What image are you showing the world around you at your workplace? Are you showing them a selfish image of you? A selfless image of God? Which is it? You see, Jesus told his disciples that if they have persecuted me, this is his words, if they have persecuted me, how much more so will they persecute you? I, I, I don't know why, but the church seems to have this teaching that once you start walking with Christ and once you become a Christian, that you know the world around you becomes all about unicorns and rainbows and strawberries and all these fun, fun, wonderful things. And that we never have any more bills to pay or sickness or issues to deal with. And then we breathe and the next moment of our life happens and we realize that life is still what life is. We still have all of those things. We still have disagreements with our spouse. We still have hard things to deal with at work. We still have tests at school. We still have fill in the blank and the list could go on and on and on of different things that we would rather not have to do. Do we show our self and our selfish motives and our self wants shining through in those moments? Or is our relationship with Jesus genuine enough that we let Christ shine through? I'm not saying you're going to be perfect and always do that. I know I'm not. That's why we had to remember point two. We've got to learn to shake it off. But we need to remember that in all of the world around us, our faith journey doesn't mean that everything becomes easy and perfect and great. It just means that God is there with us, even in the midst of the storm. That when we are in that storm, like he did with Peter, he tells us to get out of the boat and walk. Even when we are in the middle of the shipwreck, he, he, he might even give us a snake as a situation to show others that God is greater than our circumstances. God is greater than anything that wells up from within us. God is greater than that. Paul, from Rome, after he had arrived at his destination, spent three years in, in prison. He writes these words. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. It's not a Paul that's concerned about her circumstances. It's not a Paul that has to have it his way. It's a Paul that says, you know what? God's got this. God's got this. Is that where you're at this morning? Here's the thing. If you struggle with that, and you're saying, you know what? I, I get it, Stephen. I want, I want to have that attitude. I want to have that selflessness. I, I want to be able to just shake it off and move forward. I want to point others to Christ and all things. But I just don't always get it. Guess what? I'm with you. I'm with you. But you know what? God's with you as well. And God wants to so saturate yourself, your, your innermost being, that we become transformed and renewed and, and we look at the world differently than we ever did before. All it takes is that next step of surrender. It doesn't matter if you've walked with Christ for 20 years or you have uh, maybe just started a journey with him. When we find ourselves in those moments where we don't have quite enough faith 
or our reaction hasn't been quite the way that it should be, or we just don't know how to move forward. We just need that next moment of surrender where we can say, okay, God, I'm all in. It doesn't matter. Everything around me, I'm all in. If that's you, I invite you to pray this with me. God, I am a weak vessel so much. And I wish that I got it right more than I do. Just being honest, I wish that I got it right more than I do. But I thank you, God, that you never give up on me. And that as I walk with you, God, you are in the business. And you are in the process of transforming me more and more and more into your likeness. That I no longer have to be a slave to my sin-sick soul, my selfish nature, my pride, my greed, my whatever. God, forgive me of my past. Forgive me of those moments where I haven't gotten it right. But God, give me the strength to walk with you in the next moments, to trust you in those next situations. Help me to be about honoring you, walking with you everywhere I go, wherever you call me. And I, God, I thank you for your word that tells me that there is not a single situation, not one, that overcomes us when we trust in you. Help me to trust you more. God, just help me to trust you more. Not so that people can look at me and say that I've done it or that I'm a great person, but God, so that others can see you and have a relationship with you as well. Because it's for your glory and not mine. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Your most holy and precious name, Jesus.